you know, in my years of training and experiences of life, one of the things that uh, we were always taught, if there's if there's something obvious, then go ahead and get it out and open and get it over with and get on with it. Um, this morning, I'm just, I am just not up to 100% this morning. I uh, woke up not feeling well this morning. I don't think I'm about to kick the bucket or anything. It's just that uh, I'm just not altogether feeling well this morning. <clears throat> but, uh, uh, but I do know that the Lord we trust in is able to give us what we need in the time that we need it. So I ask an interest in your prayers this morning we go to the Word of God. We just sang this hymn, The House of the Lord. If you paid attention to the words, you can clearly see that there's a priority system in this life. And the hymnist, whoever it was who wrote this hymn, valued the house of God above all other things. Over the last several weeks, we've entertained the subjects concerning the first things in the Bible, the first things of the Lord, There's the law of first things. Last Sunday, we dealt with the law of first love. This morning, if the Lord be pleased, I would like to deal with what we're to seek first in this life. And we find our passage of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33. Matthew 6 and verse number 33. If you'll, you Bible students will know that this is right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mountain. The Sermon on the Mountain is a sermon or a lesson taught by Jesus Christ at the onset of his church kingdom. It's like the introductory sermon to his church kingdom. Here in uh, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 33, he says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, how many times have we heard that read? How many times have we read it? How many times have we let it pass through our mind? Um, But I'm afraid that in our present day, we don't take the time to let it sink in as to exactly what that means. First means number one in priority. First means before anything else. First means that which is essential above all other things. So what he's telling us here, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We'll talk about the kingdom in a moment, the Lord willing, and his righteousness. But it's clear that the Lord God himself, Jesus Christ, who came into this world and gave his life for us, the Son of God and verily God, he is telling us that number one in our life must be the kingdom of God above everything else. Just, uh, and he, he makes this, gives us this commandment. This is a commandment, by the way. He gives us this commandment after he described the things that we normally desire and want in this life. If you go back to verse number 24, beginning in this segment, he says, No man can serve two masters. Now, that's associated with what he said right there, Seek ye first the kingdom of uh, God and his righteousness. First, number one, he says, No man can serve two masters. That means you're going to either love one and hate the other, or you're going to hate one and love the other. Point blank. The Lord is very plain. There's, we only have one master, right? One master. One of, the, one of the things we're dealing with in biblical messages such as this is that we do not know what it's like to live under a monarch. That's the reason our ancestors over 200 years ago separated from Great Britain because they did not want to live under a monarch. They wanted to have freedom to make choices in their life. A king, in the true sense of a king, has absolute authority. All the heads of our government are embodied in one man in a king. A king is the executive for his nation. He's the legislative body. He is the judicial body. And he is also in the enforcer of his commandments, of his laws. Whatever he says stands. No one has the authority to question him and certainly to disobey his commandments. A king has absolute authority in the true sense of a monarch. Now, so we don't understand that uh, in, in a practical sense. We know it, we read it off the page, and we know it, 
But we don't know what it's like to live under a monarch. So I'm afraid that the sense of this passage is a little hard for us to grasp. That we're living under the authority of one who has absolute authority over our life. That what he says stands. The Lord told the Old Testament prophet, I am God, and I, Malachi, 3, 6, I believe, 6 or 3, maybe, I am God, and I what? Change not. That means God doesn't have to change his mind. You cannot bring additional information to him and have him change his judgment. Because he's the God that sees the end from the beginning. He never makes a mistake in his judgments. He's the God. He commands and it stands fast. That means that nobody has the authority to overthrow his commandments. As a matter of fact, we call him master. You call me master and Lord, you say, well, you, so well you say, if I then, your, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, then you also ought to wash one another's feet. We call him master, do we not? In that sense, what is a master? A master is one that we serve. We call him Lord because he owns us. That's what the word Lord means, one who owns and has authority over. He is our Lord, he owns us, he is our master, and we're subject to his every command. As a matter of fact, he even said in John 14, 50, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Our obedience to our master and Lord is a testimony of our love for him. So when he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, he means what he says. This is out of the voice of the king himself. You obey me, you do what I tell you to do, and I have told you to seek you first the kingdom of God. And by the way, we must also understand if we have the love of God in there, his commandments are not grievous. Because we desire to serve him. We desire to please him. We desire to learn his commandments and obey him. So he tells us in the opening of this segment, no man can serve two masters. Now, we can have multiple masters in this life, and if we're not careful, we'll get entangled with one master, and we'll leave the other one unserved. We have all kinds of things in this world that attract our attention. Do y'all? Has anybody thought about the Super Bowl this afternoon? Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of things we like to do, right? But now it's even, it's even more serious than the pleasant things we enjoy in this life. Watch this. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. That is natural wealth and those things that bring you comfort and joy in this life. You can't serve that and God, because what we will do as human beings, we will put more emphasis on mammon than we will on God. Well, just how serious is Jesus Christ about this? Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. That word thought is translated, if you, in the context, the context dictates this, but that word thought is translated from a word that means anxiety or lust. That means don't pay attention to the things that brings you anxiety. Now, why should we be anxious about anything? Now, I want you to tell me. We have a heavenly Father that has power over everything. We have a, a heavenly Father that's the omni-God. Omni means all. He's omnipotent. Our Father is omnipotent. That means he has all power within himself. Our heavenly Father is omniscient. means that he knows everything from the beginning to the end. You cannot introduce anything to God that he does not already know. Your heavenly Father is omnipresent, meaning he's everywhere simultaneously. And he's omniscient uh, and omnipotent, meaning that he created everything that he is. You have an almighty Father, do you not? So why should we be anxious about anything? Why should anything trouble us? You know why? Because we live in this human body. 
we have the human mind, and our and the devil likes us, loves to get us off course, when so that we will think about the things that makes us anxious, and not about the God who has all power. And besides all of that, Satan knows what you lust at, lust after. Do you know that? He knows you well, and he knows what you lust after, and he'll throw that up uh, before you to get your attention on that and off of the kingdom of God. Now watch this. He says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat. That means don't worry. That doesn't mean don't get out and work for a living. That doesn't mean that at all. That means just don't worry about it. Don't get anxious about it. And don't lust and crave. <laughs> I've said it so many times, I might as well say it now. I love lemon meringue pie, and I love turnip greens with good fat back pork in it. I do. But I'm not to lust those things. So if I have a choice of going to church or going to some place where, where there's good old country fried chicken and turnip greens and lemon meringue pie, where should I go? To the house of God. Now that's a little, that's a, that's a little mundane uh, illustration, but people make that, the children of God make that choice all the time. Am I going to church today or am I going to do this? Am I going to church today or am I going to do that? Okay. Take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for uh, your body, what you shall put on, uh, is not the life more than the meat and the body uh, than raiment. So he's telling you, he says, don't worry about these things. He's not telling you don't work, because in another place he tells the man, he that doth not work ought not to eat. So what he's, he's not telling you don't work to provide for yourself, and if we don't provide for our family, we're worse than infidels. That's not what he's telling us. He's telling us, don't worry about it, don't be anxious about it, and don't lust after things that will interfere with you going to church. Even your own natural body. <clears throat> it's ironic that I was, uh, it's ironic that I, this subject was on my mind, been on that my mind for the last week. It's ironic, I got up this morning, and I promise you one thing, <laughs> uh, it's good that I'm your pastor, because if I weren't your pastor, I would have probably have called in sick this morning. I probably would have, but I began to pray, Lord, I need strength. I need you to help me to get over this thing. I need you, Lord. And you know what? He began to bless, and I began to get better and better and better. Not 100%, but I'm better than I was. That's the God that we have. He has power over all things, including these natural bodies. Now, then he says this, Behold the fowls of the air, will they sow not? That means they don't plant. Neither do they reap, they don't go out and harvest and put into barns. Neither do they gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. He said, they don't need to be anxious because the Lord feeds them. You see the little birds out there scratching around, they flip over a leaf, and there's seeds down. There's seeds you can't even see. But God has blessed that they have plenty to eat. Little squirrels. You know, those squirrels are amazing little creatures. You know that they're out there scratching around, and you think they're just, they're, you think they're just out there putting on a show for you, but they're out there looking around because they know that God has provided them something to eat somewhere, and they know that they're going to find it. That's amazing, isn't it? So he's telling us if God provides for them, if he provides for the birds, he provides for the fowls, he provides for the squirrels, if he provides for them, guess what? He is going to provide for his beloved children. And, and, right, let's listen to this one. Verse number 20 says, Which of you, by uh, taking thought, or by wanting, uh, 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 can add one cubit to a stature? Brother Bill Poston. He was a dear, sweet brother. I loved him dearly. But Brother Bill was, what, about that tall? Something like that, about that tall? And uh, when he began to get older and feeble and his mind began to get a little bit weak, every time we went to see him in a nursing home, there was one thing that he would always say every time. Brother Stanley, I wish I was as tall as you. Say that every time. And then every time, I, it was like a recording. He'd, he'd, he'd play that. And then I'd play mine. I said, Brother Bill, if you was as tall as me, you'd have rubbed all your hair off like I did. And, but 
The point is, he could not make himself taller. I couldn't make myself shorter so I could go through all the, all the doors in a missile silo. I couldn't do that. Uh, but we are what we are, and no matter what we are, whether we're tall, whether we're short, whether we're stocky, whether we're thin, the Lord that we worship this morning provides a way for us in this life. All right? Now, then he says down to verse number 29, And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory is not arrayed like one of these. You know, the, the countryside, the beauty, the birds, and the fowls, and the creatures. He says Solomon, in all the glory that he had, was not as wonderful as they are. Beauty, and majesty, and great provision. Do you, but I want to tell you something about Solomon. For the sake of time, I'm just going to give you the passage of Scripture. It's First uh, Kings chapter 3, verses 9 through 13. Solomon, when he went into the temple and prayed, he prayed for wisdom. And God said back to him, he says, you prayed for wisdom, you didn't ask for wealth, but because you prayed for wisdom and not these things of mammon, I'm going to give you both. I'm going to give you wisdom, and I'm going to give you all of these wonderful things of life. That's what God is telling us. He says, you serve me, your heart toward me, you seek me, you seek my church, you seek my gospel, seek my word, seek to be obedient to me, and I am going to bless you in the knowledge of me, and the joy of me, and the hope of me, and I'm going to make sure you got everything you need in this life. You know what? 68 years, and God has bent my every need. And he'll not fail you. Then he says, verse number 30, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, uh, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, which means it's not of great volume, shall he not much more clothe ye, O ye of little faith? Then he goes to another subject. He says, Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? <laughs> don't worry about whether or not we're going to have something to eat. That means don't get anxious about it. That doesn't mean provide, don't provide for yourself. That means don't get anxious about it. And by the way, don't lust the best of food. God will provide for you. He says, uh, just take no thought for what we shall eat, or uh, what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. That means they put great confidence, great glory in the clothes they wear, in the food they eat, the houses they live in. Uh, you're just not much of anybody in those people's view if you don't eat the finest of food, you don't, if, you, if you don't have the finest of drinks, if you don't have the, the finest of clothing, if you don't have the finest of everything, then you're a zero and nobody. But the Lord says you're somebody. When you seek my kingdom, when you seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He says, but in spite, instead of these things, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, let me just make one comment here, and just in case I don't have a chance to get back to it. When you seek his righteousness, the root of the word righteousness is right. When you seek his righteousness, you're seeking what God has said is right. It would be good to spend a whole hour on that. In this life, we are to seek what God said is right. And we go in, in, in to evaluate, then we go back to the thou shalt not. Thou shalt not kill. A baby in his mother's womb, when you take that life, that's killing. That's murder. We can go from there. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That word there involves all kinds of sexual sins. In today's world, people don't even bother to get married anymore. And you can marry anything you want to. I can't wait. I just know one day I'm going to hear that somebody's married their puppy dog. Yep. But God has determined what's right and what's wrong. We are to seek what he says is right. It's not left open for interpretation. We can't get together and have a meeting saying we're going to decide that this is right. And whatever we decide is right, that's going to be right. He didn't leave it to us. He gave us his word and his word, he tells us what's right and wrong. So he says, seek that first. 
He doesn't say, seek uh, the kingdom of God, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, seek ye first that, and then seek all these other things. The sense, the, the sense of that phrase, the tense of that phrase, means you keep right on seeking him. That means he is perpetually in your focus. And keep looking to him. And these things that you need in this life, God will make sure that you have them. All right? Now, let's go back and focus on the kingdom just a little bit. Would you go with me to Daniel chapter, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. One of these days, I'm going to, Lord willing, I'd just like to take this whole chapter and just deal with this chapter by itself. But we just deal with a portion of it this morning. Daniel chapter 2 and verse number 44. Daniel is interpreting a, uh, a, a, a dream. He's interpreting it. And it comes down, this is a historical, uh, uh, the historical order of the change in kingdoms until the coming of the church kingdom. Verse number 44, he says, in the days of these kings, these kings in this context, you check me out, go back and study it, in the days of these kings, that is the kings of the Roman Empire. The, king, the Roman Empire had kings over all their provinces. Okay? In the days of these kings, shall the God of heaven set up a what? He's going to set up. He's going to set up a kingdom. All right? So Daniel has this prophecy from God, says in the days of these kings, he's going to, uh, the, um, the Israelite kingdom is gone. The Babylonian kingdom is gone. The, the kingdom of the Persians and the Medes is gone. Uh, the Greek, uh, the Greek kingdom is gone. And now is the Roman kingdom, the Roman empire with kings. He says, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a what? Kingdom. Well, if you got a kingdom, then who's at the top of it? The king. He's the king. And Paul writes to uh, Titus down, he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. That means he has a power and authority over all things. I want to know you. You agree with that? He has power and authority over all things. We need to know that. Because that is a testimony of what our allegiance is toward the king who has power over all things. And in the days of these kings shall the God, uh, uh, God of heaven set up a kingdom? And by the way, who set up this kingdom? Did man set it up? No. Nope. Does man decide what he wants in this kingdom? No. Nope. He sets up his own. Uh, he set up, and now it's in past tense, he set up his own kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. All these other kingdoms are destroyed. Every kingdom has been destroyed uh, in history, right on up to this very day. But this kingdom, set up by Jesus Christ in his day, has never been destroyed. And you know what? It shall never be destroyed when he comes back again. Somewhere, some big people are going to be worshiping God the Father in his kingdom in spirit and in truth. All right? And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. That means, are you, are you ready? Now get this. This is really important. The kingdom shall not be left to other people. That means he's not going to pass his kingship to somebody else. He's the only king. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. There's no other king. You got my meaning this morning? There is no authority. There is no uh, presbytery that can come together and make judicial rulings in God's kingdom. Did you know that? Because Jesus Christ himself is still the king over his kingdom. Okay? He's the king. He's the Lord. He's the master. He is everything that we need in the house of God. You know, I like to entertain the question, uh, where's the headquarters for you primitive Baptist? I love to hear that question. And there's just one simple answer right up there. Wherever there is, it's, that's where it is. The king is on his throne. Uh, why don't pastors have absolute authority in the church? You know why? Because there's only one king. And he'll not give his glory to another. There's only one king, and that's King Jesus, the Son of the living God. Shall never, and this, this kingdom shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That means it will have power, though she looks so weak and frail to the human eye. Our king is the almighty king. 
And he has gotten the victory. He's never lost a battle, and he will never lose. Now, stay in Daniel with me and go to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, and pick it up in verse number 13. Daniel 7, verse number 13. Here Daniel says, And I saw in the night visions, Daniel 7 and 13, And I saw in the night visions, And behold, one like unto the Son of Man with the clouds of heaven. Came with the clouds of heaven. Is the word Son capitalized in your Bible? If it's not, get you another one. So he says, And I saw in the night visions, And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, the Lord God Almighty, and they brought him uh, near before him, and there was given unto him, listen now, are you ready? Are you ready? There was given to him dominion. That means he has authority over. There was given him dominion and glory. He is the glorious Lamb of God. And a kingdom was given to him, that all the people, that all people, nations and languages shall serve him. That tells us that in this kingdom that he set up, there's people from every nation, kindred, tongue, and family on this earth. Okay? So what do you suppose that may have done to the Jews when they heard that? Because they thought that they were it, and only they were it, and they only had the blessings of God. But there's telling them that you're going away and the kingdom is going to come and in that kingdom there will be people from all nations. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. What does everlasting mean? That means he is never not in command. He is never not in a position where he's weak and doesn't have power, which shall not pass away. He keeps saying that over and over again. If he's king, he's always our king, right? Amen. All right. Which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that which will not be destroyed. That's three times that he emphasized the fact that this kingdom is here to stay. All right. Now, turn over to Micah. Micah chapter 4. Prophecy of Micah. Just keep turning to the right you come to Micah. Micah chapter 4. Beginning in verse number 1. Here he uses a term that we'll pursue just a little bit in a moment. But in the last days, now I'm going to tell you something about the last days. I've only got 20 minutes, so I'm just going to tell you point blank. The last days does not speak of some time in the future when the Lord's going to come back and set up a kingdom here. He's already set up his kingdom, I'm going to show you in a minute. But what's he talking about? He's talking about in the last days. Now you keep that phrase in mind because I'm going to show you when the last days are in a moment. All right, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be what? What's that word? Established, set up, established in the top of the mountains. That means above every other authority and power. There is no authority and power that is equal or above that of the kingdom of God. And it shall, you know... I love the United States of America. Let's get something out here. I love the United States of America. You know that? I gave 20 years of my young life in the service of this country. And even today, when I see the flag pass by, uh, chills run down my back. And, and when, I, when I see the, the flag, great coffins come back with our, uh, with our military folks uh, in them, uh, uh, I, come, I, I weep. Uh, because they have given so much in the defense of our country. When I see our young folks uh, leaving the country to go overseas to fight our enemies, uh, to defeat them so that we won't have to fight them here, I, uh, chills run over me and I weep uh, uh, for those young men and their families. I weep for our country because we're sending uh, the young folks of our nation into such harm. I weep for them. I weep for our law enforcement officers who give their lives every day for this country that we leave, uh, they, that we uh, I just love so dearly. So I love this country. But you'll notice that there's no flag standing here. You ever wonder why the primitive Baptists do not have a United States uh, flag standing on the pulpit with them? You know why? Because the church is above this nation. That means there's no power equal to the house. That doesn't mean that there's no power equal to me. Because they could come get me and arrest me right now. But the kingdom of God and its head, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, there is no power to match him. All right? 
So he says, and it, but in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. Verse number two, and many nations shall come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. The house of God, the kingdom of God, the house of God, the church of Jesus Christ is all the same. Now, just for the sake of explanation, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's examine the last days for a moment. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. When are the last days? Just think for a moment before we read. When are the last days? Is it sometime out in the future? Is it yesterday? Is it tomorrow? When is it? Well, I'm going to show you by the Word of God. That's the reason that in my preaching, in my study of the Word of God, I make maximum effort to point you to passages of the Scripture. I'm not giving you my idea or my philosophies. You didn't call me to preach my ideas. You called me to preach what? The Word of God. All right, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Have you seen any of that? Loving themselves and not the Lord of his kingdom. They'll be covetous. That means they want everything except what God has said to seek you first. They're boasters. They're proud of themselves. They're bragging on themselves. Even, even many in the name of religion are bragging on themselves. Look what I have done for God. Look how many souls I saved for heaven. You know, if I were looking for souls that they saved to heaven, I'd be looking as long as I live because they ain't saved to one. They're blasphemers, they're disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. What, what is what is it when a woman allows someone to take her unborn baby's life? That is a woman with, uh, without natural affection. Are we in that day? Yes, we are. We're not going to go on with it, but you get the point. Go with me to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter takes the same theme. This is uh, referred to in a number of places in the Scripture. 2 Peter chapter 3. And... Um, Verse number 3, knowing this first, 2 Peter 3 and 3, knowing this first, that there shall come when? In the last days, scoffers. Have you heard of anybody laughing at religion lately? Laughing at those who have faith in Jesus Christ and depend upon Him? They're scoffing, they're mocking. Even those who profess themselves to be Christian are denying the deity of Jesus Christ, denying His authority over Him, uh, denying that He came to this world and saved His people from their sins. One of the, I had the opportunity to entertain this conversation just this past week uh, when I was asked the question, what's the difference between a primitive Baptist and other Baptists? My answer is, when Jesus Christ came into this world, He saved everyone that His Father gave Him before the foundation of the world, and of all He had, get, Father had given Him, He lost nothing. That's the difference right there. That's the difference. All right? So Peter says, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust. Jesus Christ says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. He said, Don't give any thought for those things that your heart and your mind desires in this world, but keep your attention upon the Lord Jesus Christ. One more place, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. John has something to say about the last days. He makes it so clear until you've got to, you've got to intentionally look over this to not get it. 1 John chapter 2. And verse number 18, he starts this phrase this way, little children. You know, it's like, it's like a grandpa taking his little children on, on, on his side. He said, children, I, I've got to tell you something. There's something very important that I want you to know. You need this in your life. You need this for comfort and guidance in life. He says, little children, it is the what? What does he say it is? It is the last time. That means you're living in it now. It is the last time. In the days of these kings, a kingdom shall be set up. We'll come back to that in a moment. He says, it is the last time. And as you have heard, that end Christ shall come. Even now there are many, what? 
Antichrist, whereby we know that it is the last time. Twice, he declares that it is the last time. So let me tell you something this morning. You're living in the last days. When Jesus Christ entered into the world, came into this world, we entered into the last days. That was the last segment of time we entered into it. And the prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and his kingdom were fulfilled at that time. As a matter of fact, remember what Daniel said? Uh, Daniel, God gave to Daniel, told him, in the days of these kings, uh, uh, a kingdom shall be set up. Jesus Christ said in John, uh, Matthew 16 and 18, he says, upon this rock I build something. What did he say I build? I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He is telling us that he set up his kingdom just like God promised through Daniel. God never lies, does he? Whatever he promises, he keeps it. Do you have the kingdom of God with you today? You're a part of it. You're a member of it. You, your life is committed to it. Uh, he's your king. He's your lord. He's your master. He's your provider. Because one of the duties of the king was to provide for his people, to protect his people, to love his people, to guide his people, to train his people, and your king is your master, your lord, and your keeper. Now, Zechariah, go with him into Zechariah. Go to Zechariah, you get, get, you go to Matthew, then Malachi, and then Zechariah right behind it. Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13. In that day, you ready? In that day, this is prophecy, in that day. Now get a hold of your seat. In that day, there shall be a fountain opened wide. What fountain? Cool drink of water? What fountain? Watch this. In that day, there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of children. For what? For sin and uncleanness. What fountain was open? It was the fountain of his blood. That fountain was opened. He shed his blood. He washed our sins away. He cleansed us from our iniquity and made us fit for heaven. And he declared that it was done when he said, It is finished on the cross. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols uh, out of the land. They're not going to be the idols. They're not going to be kissing idols. They're not going to be bound down to idols. That means the idol of man or a woman or, or any uh, physical thing. Uh, you're not going to, uh, my people are not going to kiss those things, not going to serve those things, not going to worship those things. Our attention is to be toward Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And I will cut off the names of the idols uh, out of the land, and there shall be no more remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land. He says, I, in my kingdom, my kingdom is going to be a pure kingdom. So, have you ever had the question asked, wh 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 where are your pictures? Have you ever had anybody coming? And, and I, 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 right here, I, I've, had, I've had the question asked to me, where are your pictures? Where are your icons? I never thought about it until he was asked. And then said, Roger, what are they saying? Where are they? I looked at our blank walls. Where are they? I said, we don't need any. Jesus Christ is what we worship. We don't worship pictures. We don't worship uh, idols. We don't worship icons. We worship Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. And so we take that literally to mean that God meant what he said. We worship him to worship and to serve the Lord our God. Now, in Matthew 16 and 28, Jesus Christ said, Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So we find there that the church kingdom of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ built it. Now, has the kingdom come? It has come. You know, he even told, 16 to 28, 16 to 28, listen to this. He says, Verily I say unto you, that's the man who was standing here before him, Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his what? 
Okay, what are the two options here? One option is there's a very old man on this earth. What's the other option? The kingdom has come. And if you'll read, for the sake of time, we won't go there, and in Luke chapter 9 and 27, he says the same thing, but in a little different way. He says, there's some of you standing here that not taste death until they see the kingdom coming. Meaning that the king is coming, and the king is coming. So is the kingdom of God here? You're in it. You're a part of it this morning. Now, Jesus Christ, John, uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 5, uh, 6 and 15, Paul tells Timothy that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That means he has ultimate and final authority over all things. Now, <clears throat> Titus 2 and 14. Go there with me. Titus 2 and 14. Paul wrote to these young preachers instructing them things that they were to preach to others, that they might be an encouragement to others, and that the, uh, that the church's focus would be upon Jesus Christ and Him only. To, uh, uh, Titus 2 and verse number 9, he says, <clears throat> Exhort servants to be obedient unto their masters, and please them well in all things, not answering them. So what does that mean? He's telling, uh, and you read down the other instructions, he says, you teach folks to be good citizens, be hard workers in this life, don't be slothful, don't be uh, a person that's just uh, living off of everybody else around you. You teach the congregation to be good citizens and hard workers. Does that make sense to us? All right. Now go over uh, to First, uh, first Peter uh, chapter 2 and verse number 9. Peter says that in a, just a slightly different way and puts a different emphasis on it. Now, uh, 1 Peter 2 and 9. But ye, who are the ye? When you read the scripture, you need to find out who these pronouns are. If you go back to chapter 1, hold your finger there and go back to chapter 1. Verse number 1, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, uh, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And then he puts a, a label on them. Are you ready? Elect according uh, to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect. Do you believe in the doctrine of election this morning? When does the Bible tell us that God made this election? Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians, Ephesians 1 and 4, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. So he made this choice before the foundation of the world, so Peter is writing to the elect of God. But ye, the elect, are a chosen generation. What are you chosen for? What is expected of you? But ye are a chosen generation, you are a royal priesthood. Boy, it's just too much here to let go. A, your royalty, your royal priesthood, a, a, a royalty or a king, as it is, it refers to my royalty, meaning you have authority. You have authority. That's number one. Okay, you got it? You have authority this morning. Okay, just hold your finger up like I am because I won't we'll forget it. You have royalty this morning and you are a priesthood. A priesthood is one who has direct access to God to make sacrifice and to plead for the people. All right? You have authority and you have access to God. And so what does that mean? Hebrews 4 and 16, we can therefore now come boldly because you have the authority and you have the position. Therefore, you, uh, you can come boldly unto the throne of grace where you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You are a royal priesthood this morning. And uh, so who do you, do you need somebody to, to open the door uh, to the throne room for you? No. Nope. Do you have to go through someone to get there? No. Nope. You yourself can come into your into your most private place, into your clo uh, your closet, and you can get down on your knees, and you can speak directly in the ear of the Lord God Almighty. Does that impress you? That impresses me. That lifts me up. That comforts me. And so can the devil throw anything at you that you can't overcome? Absolutely not when you're speaking in the ear of the Lord God Almighty. Now, that you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. He says, called you to praise his name. You want to know what your job? I've had people say, but I don't know what my duty is. Well, just open the word of God. If you love the Lord, 
That's a sign that He loves you. And if you love Him and He loves you, then your duty is to praise His name. It's your duty to speak honorably of His name, to speak gloriously of His name, to pray to Him in His name, uh, to sing praises unto Him in His name, and to hear uh, the gospel preached in His name, and to live according to His name, for He has authority over you. Now, Did you know that one of the names that this is this is found in Isaiah fifty five and four? One of the the names given to Jesus Christ is Commander. Commander. Did you know that? It's right there. He's the commander. He's the king, and he issues commands. Well, uh, unless you served in law enforcement or in the military, you probably don't have a good concept of what a commander is. If you are in a stressful situation, and the commander says. Do a certain thing. What are your options? None. You have to do what he said to do. Also, it is his job to look out for you. Do you know that? It's his job to look out for you, to run interference for you. But if you're in a stressful situation and your commander says, I want you behind that tree right there, you get right there. I don't care what's happening, how hostile the environment is. If he says, get behind that tree, that car, that building, you get right there, right then. That is your only option. Do you know that? That's what a commander is. That When our commander commands, what are our options? None. And you know what? His commandments aren't grievous. And why aren't they grievous? It doesn't disturb us. It doesn't uh, discourage us because we know that He loves us with a great love. And our obedience to Him is a testimony of our love toward Him. Now, some of the commandments that He gives us, do you know when in Acts chapter 10, you can read it on your own time, in Acts chapter 10, when Peter went to Cornelius' house, you remember Cornelius? He was a, he was a Roman centurion, and um, he had been uh, uh, hearing about Jesus Christ, and he began to uh, learn about him and loved him, and the Lord had given him love uh, for, for him, and he was gathering his family, he was worshiping with his family, and so in, in a vision, the Lord says, you send down to, uh, uh, to a little town there along the coast, uh, you send down there, and there's a man down there named Peter. You send for him and tell him to come on up here to you. So long story short, he sent for him, and Peter went. When he got to Cornelius' house, what did he find? He found that the Spirit of God was among them, and they loved the Lord. And so when he saw that, he commanded them to do something. You remember what he commanded them to do? Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Did you know, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, that baptism is not an option? That's a commandment. Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, well, even on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, when Peter and told them, they, when, when they, when the, those who heard Peter's sermon said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, well, if you want to, when it feels right, when you have time, repent and be baptized. You know, he didn't say that at all. He just answered very clearly, this is a command from the Lord God Almighty through the Apostle Peter, repent and be baptized, every one of you. Do it right now, just get it done. And 3,000 of them joined the, was added to the church that day. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? All right? Now, our king, our king, would you go back with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Our king has the authority and the power to promise you things. For he is, in essence, the God that cannot what? Lie. Your king and his authority and power has promised you something. Would you look at this? Ephesians chapter 1 and verse number 11. In whom? That whom is Jesus Christ in John chapter 10. Remember I already said to you, need, when you see a pronoun, find out who that pronoun is referring to. That pronoun in verse number 11, Ephesians 1 and 11, is Jesus Christ in whom also we have obtained. Now, if you have obtained something, what does that mean? You are in possession of it now. It belongs to you now. We have obtained an inheritance being what? 
predestinated. Do you pray about the bathroom freedom of the doctrine of predestination? I surely do. In whom, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. How about that? We have a king that does what's his will to do. How about that? You like that? We love that. Because he's our master, he's our lord and our king, and he's promised to us an inheritance. Well, let's pursue that inheritance a little bit. Why don't you go with me to uh, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1, just for a moment. Titus chapter 1. What are the things that he's promised us? What about this eternal life that he has promised to us? A God that cannot lie has promised you that he would do certain things for you, provide for you, and, and help you, and comfort you, and strengthen you. He said, come unto me, all you that labor to heaven laden, and I will give you what? Rest. He, that's the kind of king we got. In Titus chapter 1, verse number 1. Here, Paul, a servant of God, and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and according to the truth, which is after godliness, in hope, in hope of what? In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised when? Before the world begun. That tells me this morning that the God that cannot lie made us a promise that we'll have eternal life, and that eternal life is with Him in glory. And this is, this is something that we believe by faith. Where did you get faith? If you believe it, God has put this faith in you, which is the substance and the evidence that we might know that these things are so. Now, talking about the, the authority of the king, the power of our king, he's promised to comfort us, to give us rest, he's told us to take up our cross and follow him in this life, be um, a faithful servant to him. One of these days you're going to hear the voice of your king. In Matthew 25 and 34, you're going to hear the voice of your king. When he speaks, he speaks with authority and power. When he commands, it stands fast, and nothing can defy him. None can say unto him, What doest thou? None can hinder him. Nebuchadnezzar found that out the hard way. So one day, this king who says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things shall be added unto you. One day, you are going to hear his voice. And this is what he's going to say. Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. One day, the king that you serve, you will hear his voice. I believe that the dead will audibly hear that voice. And the dead shall rise, and those who remain alive will be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and we'll all be caught up together in the air with the Lord, so shall we ever be. So when we face the storms of life, whether they be a hurricane, whether they be some great trial in this life, when we face them, we can face them knowing that in this world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer for our King has overcome the world. What a blessing. What a joy to know that we have a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And it just so happens, no it didn't, it's on purpose. That friend that sticketh closer than a brother is our King, Almighty. And He will never forsake us and never leave us alone. May God bless you, my prayer.